Let us now turn in our Bibles to the Gospel according to Matthew. Our text for today is Matthew chapter 11, verses 7 through 15. And uh, actually, I think we'll go back to the, we'll read verses 2 through 7 through 15, but our text is 7 through 15. This is the word of God. Now, when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk, lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them, and blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in kings' houses. What then did you A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. <laughs> Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. As far as the reading of God's word, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Matthew. We thank you for this inspired portion of your word, this meaty uh, presentation of Christ and his glory, Christ the Messiah, the fulfillment of all the promises of God. We ask you to be with us today, that you would be present by your spirit to open our eyes, to give us hearts that are receptive, that we might hear the gospel, that we might respond in faith. This we ask in Christ's name. Amen. So the title of the sermon today is taken from verse 12, The Violent Taking the Kingdom by Force. The title is Pressing into the Kingdom. But before we get to verse 12, there is this whole section here about John the Baptist. And so the outline of the sermon is point one, the final arrow. And by arrow, I don't mean, don't think of like a bow and arrow and pulling the arrow back. I mean like one of those sign arrows, right? An arrow pointing to something. Like on the side of the road, big illuminated sign. So first is the final arrow, verses seven through 10. Second is the present kingdom, verses 11 through 15. And then third is the application, which we'll be focusing on that verse that is the basis of the title of the sermon, pressing into the kingdom, the violent taking the kingdom by force. Very interesting verse, hard to understand exactly what's going on there in verse 12, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now remember the context. The context is that John has been thrown into prison by Herod the king because Herod didn't like his message. He was telling Herod that it was unlawful for him to have his brother's wife. And he was condemning Herod for his violation of God's law. And Herod didn't like that, of course, had him imprisoned. Of course, later on we find out in Matthew chapter 14 that he is going to have him beheaded. Uh, so he will become a martyr for the gospel. But while John is rotting away in prison, uh, he is perplexed, and so he sends two of his disciples to go to Jesus and to ask him, are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answers him and says, go and tell John what you hear and see. And then he lists off all of the things that Jesus is doing, his ministry of healing the sick, cleansing the lepers, 
raising the dead, and then concluding with that last phrase there in verse 5, the poor have the good news preached to them, taken from Isaiah chapter 61. That is the whole point of all the miracles and the healings and the casting out of demons. It is to be the outward and visible sign of the preaching of the good news of the gospel, of deliverance from the power of Satan, of deliverance from sin and death itself. And so Jesus here is making an argument to John, which is although John expected Jesus to come with that winnowing fork of judgment to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire, yet Jesus has not yet come to do that. He will. His second coming will be a coming of judgment. But in his first coming, he is coming to preach the gospel to the spiritually poor and needy people of Israel. And so he is telling John, yes, I am the Messiah, but you need to reconfigure your Messiah concept. Your expectation of what the Messiah will do is not the same as what you thought. He, this Messiah is coming to save his people from their sins. And of course, he's going to do that ultimately through the cross, through his own suffering. Now, this discussion between Jesus and John, although it's happening through the intermediaries of these two disciples of John, this discussion between Jesus and John over the nature of the Messiah's kingdom gives Jesus an opportunity to reflect on the importance of John and his ministry. As the two disciples of John go back and go their way, verse 7, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John the Baptist. He begins to tell them who John was and the significance of his ministry. And so what does Jesus basically say here? What is the essence of what Jesus is getting at in this section? Well, the first point is he is saying that John is the final arrow. Imagine, you know, the, the metaphor you're driving along, let's say, you know, one of those desert highways, and, you know, it keeps telling you, coming up, there's going to be some food and lodging, right? And you get like closer and closer to the place. And then you have the final arrow that says, turn off here. This is the place. This is the best restaurant on the, on the pathway here on the road. John is that final arrow, according to Jesus. Now, before he gets to that, Jesus uh, raises some uh, obvious rhetorical questions about what John is not, right? He says, what did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind, that is, a reed swaying in the wind. The idea of a reed swaying in the wind, meaning someone who is just blown about by every opinion, who uh, just adapts his message to whatever the people want to hear. If the wind's blowing that direction, oh, he'll go and talk about that. If the wind's blowing that direction, he'll sway over there and talk about that. No, obviously, that's not the kind of person John was. Everybody knows that. These are rhetorical questions. He wasn't a reed shaken by the wind, just the opposite, right? He was this steadfast prophet of God who was uncompromising and stern. He was someone in the mold of Elijah who spoke truth to power and suffered for it as a result. And the second question Jesus asked, also a rhetorical question, what then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Obviously not, right? He's not a man who was going about in dainty clothing and living a life of luxury. No, he was a rough man. He was rough around the edges. He was a craggy man like Elijah. He was living out there in the desert. He had no place to live. He had no palace to dwell in. He was a prophet. So obviously then, what then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, that is exactly the right description of John the Baptist. He was a prophet. But interestingly, Jesus doesn't stop there. So the first two questions, what did you go out to see? Was it a reed? No. Was it a man dressed in sock clothing? No. The third one is yes. You went out to see a prophet? Yes. But, he says, although that is the right answer, you went out to see a prophet like Elijah, although that's the right answer, I tell you, he was more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you. This is a quotation from Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. 
Malachi chapter 3 is telling us that there is going to be a messenger who will come to prepare the way of the Lord. It's interesting that in the original text of Malachi, it says, he will prepare the way before me. So Yahweh, God is speaking, and he's saying that this messenger is going to prepare the way before me, that Yahweh is going to come, and he is going to come in power and judgment. Why does it switch? Why does, when Jesus quotes it, why does he switch it to you? Behold, I send my messenger before your face, and he will prepare the way before you. Well, it's because of the close connection between Jesus and Yahweh. He is God incarnate. And so he is coming. Uh, Jesus himself is Yahweh coming in the flesh. And John the Baptist is the messenger who is preparing the way. He's the forerunner who is preparing the way. Interestingly, in Malachi, if you go back and look at the last two chapters of Malachi, Malachi 3 and 4, Malachi 3 talks about this messenger who's going to come and prepare the way for the coming of the Messiah, who represents God in the flesh. But then in the next chapter, Malachi 4, the last chapter of Malachi, it identifies him as Elijah. Elijah is that messenger. Elijah, not literally raised from the dead, but an Elijah-like figure is going to come. And Jesus, of course, identifies John the Baptist with that figure, verse 14. If you're willing to accept it, he is this Elijah, the Elijah of Malachi 4, who is to come. Just an interesting note here. Um, why do you think it is that the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament canon? The book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament canon precisely because it has this prophecy of this messenger who is going to prepare the way for the Messiah, who is also described as being Elijah, who is to come. The Jewish uh, people have a different order of their books of the Bible, the books of the Old Testament. The Jewish canon uh, has a different book at the end. Their, their book is... Uh, First and Second Chronicles, at the very end of the Old Testament. But the Christian order, the Christian canon, has Malachi last, so that as you're reading the Old Testament, you come to Malachi 3 and 4 about this messenger who is Elijah, and then you can turn the page right over to the New Testament, to Matthew and the Gospels, which begins with... Uh, the story of John the Baptist in Matthew chapter 3 and how he comes to prepare the way for Christ. What is Jesus saying here? He's saying that John the Baptist is the culmination of the Old Testament. Just as John was the last prophet, the forerunner who bore witness to the Messiah, so also the entire Old Testament scriptures have a prophetic function of pointing to and witnessing to the coming of the Messiah. Just think about what was John the Baptist's message. The, the fundamental thing that John the Baptist was saying was what? He was saying, I'm just a forerunner. Uh, I'm coming to prepare the people to get them ready for the coming of the Messiah. What does he say? He says, after me comes one who is mightier than I. John the Baptist was not preaching himself. He wasn't saying, look how great I am. I'm this awesome prophet. He's saying, look, I'm just the forerunner. I'm just the, 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 the arrow pointing to the really important person who's going to come after me, who is Jesus, the Messiah. That same message of John the Baptist, that I'm just a forerunner preparing the way and telling you that something great is coming, someone great is coming, that's exactly what the Old Testament as a whole is doing. The Old Testament has a John-like ministry. The entire Old Testament, from Genesis to Malachi, is a forerunner. It is a giant arrow preparing the way for the Messiah. Uh, one of the commentaries that I like on Matthew uh, by Donald Hagner uh, says this. He says, John is the climax of the old order. A prophet like those of the past, but more than a prophet. 
He is the one in whom the Old Testament expectation has been distilled into one final definitive arrow pointing to the presence of the Messiah. Now you know where I got that idea from. Hagner is so right in saying that the entire Old Testament is distilled down into one final definitive prophetic arrow saying, here he is, the Messiah is about to come. And that's why, of course, John had such an important role in the stories of the gospel, because he is the one who baptizes Jesus and thereby publicly announces that he is here, that the Messiah has come and presents Jesus to Israel as the fulfillment of the promises of God in the Old Testament. So it's interesting, isn't it? In Jesus here has just had this dialogue with John and discussing what is the nature of his messianic ministry, that it's a ministry of preaching the good news to the spiritually poor. And then as the disciples of John go back, Jesus begins to talk about John. And he, he kind of gives his evaluation of John's ministry and what John is all about. But although it seems like he's talking about John, in reality, he's using that as a way of talking about himself. He's saying, what was John? He was simply a forerunner. He was simply the messenger who was preparing the way for me, for the Messiah. And that brings us then to the second point, the present kingdom. Because the arrow is pointing to something. The arrow is pointing to Christ himself. And proof of the fact that John was merely a pointer, a sign a forerunner, is the reality of the fulfillment that has come in Christ after John. So Jesus begins to talk about himself and his ministry in verses 11 through 15, the present kingdom. Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. And yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John's personal salvation is not the issue here. He's not saying that John is not saved. He's not saying that John is outside of the kingdom in the sense of personally being lost or something like that. He's talking about John's role in the history of redemption. And what Jesus is trying to highlight here is just how wonderful the new reality is that is dawning in his own person and ministry and work. Just how wonderful this kingdom is that he is bringing in. It's so wonderful. It's so awesome. It's so amazing. It's so overflowing with life and salvation and forgiveness and hope and healing and restoration that even the least important member of that kingdom, even the least important member of the church, let's say, the least important member of Christ's kingdom is greater than John because we live in the era of the fulfillment and not in the era of the promise and the prophetic expectation. It's as if Jesus is saying, look, there's a massive fault line dividing these two tectonic plates, like the San Andreas Fault, right? On the one side is the old covenant order, the, t the order of the types and shadows, the time of prophetic expectation, and on the other side of the, tectonic, uh, of the fault line is the other tectonic plate, which is the era of fulfillment, the era of the presence of the kingdom of God in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And John, even though he's the last prophet, even though he's the culminating distillation of all the Old Testament promises, he's still on that other side of the fault line. He still belongs to the time of the old age to the time of the promise and not to the time of the fulfillment. And Jesus says that very plainly. He says, verse 12, which we'll get at in a minute, from the days of John the Baptist until now, that is, from the days of my ministry, which occurred in the days of John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. For, notice verse 13, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That is a powerful statement. This is a powerful way of saying that the entire Old Testament was a prophetic witness to Christ. The Old Testament ceremonies, 
and types. We mentioned when we were reading through the Ten Commandments, the Fourth Commandment about the Sabbath. All of the things of the Old Testament, the Sabbath, the ceremonies, the land promise, the temple, the priestly ministry that God ordained, the law itself, all the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and so on. The entire Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi is pointing to Christ. It is leading to Christ. And what that means then is that as we read the Old Testament, we must read it from that expectation that Christ is the point, that Christ is the message of the Old Testament scriptures. He is the target. You know, imagine like a, a target, right, with the concentric circles. He's the red dot in the very center. Yes, there's a lot of things going on in the Old Testament. You can get lost in the weeds, right? You can get lost in all the stories of the different kings of Israel and Judah and all the different details of what goes on with the life of Israel and the patriarchs and so on. But all of that, that's all the periphery, but it all is focusing in upon that central point, which is the target, which is Christ himself. Jesus is saying that we are in the age of the new covenant, of the fulfillment. John, as great as he was, belongs to the old side of the divide. You know, there are many passages in the Gospels where Jesus says that the kingdom is something future. Right? He talks about the kingdom as a future reality. There's going to be a day of judgment. He's going to separate the, the sheep from the goats. There's going to be a time of gathering the, the, uh, uh, the wheat into his barn. This idea that the kingdom is a future reality is clearly taught in many passages in the Gospels. But alongside those, alongside all the passages that talk about a future coming of the kingdom, there are also a number of very important passages, such as this one, that focus on the presence of the kingdom in Christ's first coming. That the very reality of Jesus himself as the king of the kingdom of God, coming into this earth and doing miracles and preaching the gospel and going to the cross, that is the presence of the kingdom. And this text here in Matthew 11, especially verses 11 through 13, is one of the passages that most emphatically teaches that. It teaches that the real fault line is with the first coming of Christ, not the second coming of Christ, right? The two tectonic plates, the fault line is with the first coming of Christ. John is the very end of that. He's the very, uh, the very border of that line, leading to the transition point into the new covenant era and the presence of the kingdom. And Jesus here in this passage is clearly teaching that the kingdom has come. Now there's going to be a future coming where it comes in even greater fullness, a coming of judgment, a coming of glory and the new creation and the total destruction of any sin and the wiping out of all the wicked. Yes, that there is a future coming, but the reality is that the kingdom has already come in the presence of Christ himself in his ministry and teaching. And so that brings us then to verse 12, which I want to focus in upon, which is also the application. Verse 12 says, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. In other words, what Jesus is saying is this. He's saying, as evidence that the kingdom is present, look at all these people who are no longer simply waiting and hoping and expecting the kingdom. They're actually forcefully pressing into it. And what he's referring to here is all of the people that we've seen in Matthew 8 and 9 who have come to Jesus for grace. Just think of the leper. Lord, if you are able, you can make me clean. If you are willing, you can make me clean. Or think of the woman who had a flow of blood that made her impure. And she said, if I only touch the hem of his garment, I shall be cleansed from my sin. Or think of the blind men crying out, Son of David, have mercy upon us. The fact that there are these people, and of course it's not the majority, the majority of Israel is unbelieving, but the fact that there are these men and women and even children who are coming to Christ using holy violence to lay hold upon the kingdom, to lay hold upon Christ and to receive his grace and salvation. This is proof that the kingdom is present. 
they're not living in the days of the other side of the tectonic divide. They're not living in the days of promise and hope and waiting and crying out to God, saying, Lord, when are you going to deliver us? We're waiting. We're here in exile. The Romans are still in control. Lord, we're, we're lamenting. We're crying out for deliverance. No, they're already entering the kingdom by faith in Christ. Now, this verse here, verse 12, has been debated. Uh, interestingly, the majority view today, if you look at most of the commentaries today, is that they take this violence here as being a literal violence. So there's basically two ways of interpreting this, this language here of the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence and the violent take it by force. You could either be referring to unholy violence or it could be referring to holy violence. If it's unholy violence, which is the majority view today among most scholars, it's talking about how the kingdom of God is under attack. And there are violent men who are opposing the kingdom, such as the opponents of Christ himself, whether it's King Herod, right? He's using violence to silence John the Baptist and throw him into prison. Later on, he's going to put him to death. Uh, maybe it's the Pharisees who are attacking Christ and accusing him of performing miracles uh, by the power of Beelzebub. So the unholy violence view is that this is literal violence referring to opposition to the kingdom, those who are trying to stop the kingdom. But the holy violence view is actually, even though it's not the modern view that most commentators take, it's actually the traditional view. It's the view of all the church fathers. It is the traditional understanding. And if you go back to an earlier version of the New International Version, the 1984 edition, it translates it this way. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing and forceful men lay hold of it. And I think that is really a helpful way of understanding. I think that's the correct translation. How do we know which view is right? How do we know that it's holy violence and not unholy violence? That it's this idea of faith, of laying hold upon Christ by faith, not this idea of being opposed to Christ and the gospel. A couple of things. One is that there is a parallel passage in the gospel of Luke. In Luke chapter 16, verse 16, we read this. Notice how similar it is to uh, the parallel here in Matthew 11, verse 12. The law and the prophets were until John. Since then, the good news of the kingdom is preached and everyone forces his way into it. It's obviously positive, right? Since then, the good news of the kingdom is being proclaimed and everyone is forcing his way into the kingdom. So those who take the literal view that this is referring to unholy violence and opposition to Christ and the kingdom, they say, yeah, well, there is that passage in Luke 16, 16, but we just take that as being a different, it's not a related passage, it's not a true parallel. Or they'll say, it was the same saying of Jesus, but Matthew and Luke interpreted it differently. I don't think that's correct. I think that we should take the Bible as being unified and consistent with itself. And so therefore, the parallel in Luke which helps us to shed light upon this passage here in Matthew 11. In addition, not only do we have the parallel in Luke 16, but we also have the context itself. The context is that Jesus is appealing to the fact that people are pressing into the kingdom as evidence that the kingdom has come, right? Remember, that was the whole argument that we were making before. The kingdom is present. It's a reality. It's not only a future thing. It's also a present reality. And what's the proof of that? That people are forcing their way in. They're using holy violence to enter into the kingdom. Remember I mentioned the NIV 1984 edition that translates the first part of the verse as the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. I think that's correct. We see that in the ministry of Jesus, in the power and authority of Jesus the Messiah, as he is going about preaching the gospel of the kingdom with authority and casting out demons with authority and raising the dead. And with authority, he forgives sins. That is the kingdom of heaven, forcefully advancing in Christ, in his person. In the person of Christ, the kingdom has come with holy power. Christ is invading the kingdom of darkness and rescuing sinners from the grasp of Satan. And this is demonstrated in his miracles of healing the sick, 
and delivering those who were oppressed by demons. Until the ministry of Jesus, the kingdom was only prophesied. Remember, Jesus himself quotes from all those passages in Isaiah. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the, the dead are raised up, the poor have the good news preached unto them. Until Jesus actually came, the kingdom was only prophesied. Until that point, until Christ came, one could only hope for it, one could only wait for it. But now men can lay hold of it by faith. They can seize it like plunder. That's actually the word that's used there where it says the violent take it. The, the, word, the verb take it by force has this idea of seizing the plunder. This is proof that the kingdom has come because Christ has come. And so the application of the passage then is that we must, we are called to engage in holy violence. Faith is more than simply giving passive assent to the truths of the gospel. It involves an ardent seeking after Christ. Calvin puts it this way in his comment on this verse. He says, let us also learn from these words about the kingdom uh, suffering violence and the violent taking it by force. Let us also learn from these words what is the true nature and operation of faith. It leads men not only to give cold and indifferent assent when God speaks, but to cherish warm affection towards him and to rush forward, as it were, with a violent struggle. And it begins with being conscious of your need and your need of God's grace. If you have no sense of need, if you have no sense of, I'm a sinner, I'm guilty before God, I need Christ, I need salvation, then there won't be this eagerness and this ardent desire for Christ. And furthermore, not only does it presuppose a sense of your need of Christ, it also involves hearing the grace that is offered in the promise of the gospel. Why are the crowds of people, lepers and people with sicknesses and so on, why are they crowding around Jesus? Why are they coming to Jesus? Because they've heard the good news. They've heard about the preaching of the gospel that Jesus is proclaiming, and they've heard the the stories of his miracles. And so not only do we need to be conscious of our sin, we also need to hear the offer of the gospel. We need to hear the gospel preached in order to stir up our affections with holy energy to get to Christ. I'm kind of uh, thinking about this analogy that, I was trying to think of different analogies for this, this idea of this holy violence and the best analogy I could come up with, I don't know if you've ever seen these uh, videos of uh, people who are um, basically fishermen who are showing how, how, what does it look like under the water, right? When you throw out your bait into the water. Uh, and sometimes, of course, we think of like the traditional, uh, just like an earthworm or something and the fish comes and grabs it. But there are some times where, especially in deep sea fishing, where if you're using, you know, live bait, you can get this, this school of fish that are coming to, to fight over, over the tasty morsel. And they show these videos under the water of just this, the, the, the bait is being mobbed by other fish and so on. That's kind of the idea here, right? That's what we're seeing here in the ministry of Jesus as we read this, the gospel story. There's a certain sense of excitement, like frenzied fish fighting over the tasty morsel. Calvin puts it this way, a vast assembly of men is now collected as if men were rushing violently forward to seize the kingdom of God. They come together in crowds and receive not only with eagerness, but with vehement impetuosity, the grace which is offered to them. And notice as well, another key point in the text, after verse 12, the violent take it by force. What is the very next verse? Verse 13. For all the law, all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. That word for is very significant because it provides the ground for using this holy force. The violent take it by force. Why? Because of the scriptures because of the law and the prophets, which prophesied until John. 
In other words, this holy force, this, this vehemence in, in seeking the grace of God, it depends upon the promises of God. If we don't have God's word, if we don't have the scriptures to give us the promises, then we would have no basis to come forward with that zeal to receive the grace of God. Because it's God himself who's inviting us. It's God himself who in his word is saying, come to me, that I will never cast you out, that if you believe in me, you can have grace and salvation. And so there's a sense in which this idea of um, coming to the Lord in this holy violence, in this vehement seeking for grace, depends upon the promises of God. And in fact, that's what we're doing when we come to God in that vehemence, is we're pleading the promises. And Jesus himself said that very thing, didn't he? In Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Remember, it was near the end of the Sermon on the Mount. He said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. And the parallel in Luke, in Luke chapter 11, verse 13, is that God will not withhold his Holy Spirit from those who ask. God delights in his children coming to his throne of grace to prevail upon him. The promise itself invites us to do that. The promises of scripture are there just for that very purpose, to, to whet your appetite, to make you eager for those blessings that he wants to give us. But he wants us to plead for them. He wants us to seek them. He delights in being prevailed upon by his children. The promise invites us to use holy force to pry it open with faith. And so we ought to be earnest in seeking Christ and all his benefits. And this isn't just something that happens at the beginning of the Christian life. This is throughout our lives, seeking God's grace. I mean, very simply, you can just boil it down to one word. It's praying for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We have the gift of the Holy Spirit, but we pray for more of the Holy Spirit. And we receive his grace. And he uses that very process of hungering and thirsting and seeking his grace and seeking more of the Spirit to be the means by which he answers our prayers. Let us pray. Lord Christ, we thank you that you are the Messiah, the one in whom all the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled. We thank you that in you the kingdom of heaven has come, that it is forcefully advancing in your person and in your work. And because of the power and authority of your kingship, the enemy has been conquered and sin and death have been vanquished. And so we, your people, have been granted faith that we might eagerly press into your kingdom. Work in us more of that eagerness, more delight in you, more zeal to get the blessings of salvation and life that you offer. We know our shortcomings and failings. We're conscious of our struggles, but we hunger and thirst after you, O Christ. Give us a holy violence to lay hold of your grace, to suck the marrow out of your promises, and to seize the spoils of the victory that you have won for us. Amen.